can you hear me? Yeah, good. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, first of uh, the keynote lectures at this Congress. Um, my name is Uwe Grimm, I'm the chair of the uh, Commission on Apriotic Crystals, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Ron Lipschitz from uh, Tel Aviv. Um, Ron um, uh, has um, um, worked uh, on several areas in uh, quasi-crystallography, I'd say, and he did his PhD um, at Cornell University uh, with David Merman, and he was looking there at um, finding a neat uh, theory for the description and classification of symmetry of aperiodic crystals, which does not use uh, higher dimensional um, superspace uh, description. Um, and uh, after that, he went on to do a postdoc at Caltech, where he studied magnetic order and um, uh, color symmetries. Um, and uh, the last, uh, and then he moved on to do other things, working on more physical uh, properties, uh, stability of quasi crystals. And the last 10 years or so, he has been uh, mainly interested in uh, soft quasi crystals and quasi crystals forming in soft matter systems. That is what he will be talking about today. Uh, Ron um, is a professor at uh, Tel Aviv and also currently the chair, I think, of the Connect Matter um, department. He is one of the previous chairs of the uh, Commission on Aperiodic Crystals and he also organized a meeting in 2007 in Tel Aviv uh, to celebrate the silver jubilee of the discovery of quasi crystals. Um, uh, and also he got uh, an award, that's the Jean-Marie Dubois Award for Quasi Crystals, in, I believe it was in 2013. So um, please welcome uh, Ron uh, to talk about uh, soft matter quasi crystals. Thank you very much, Uwe. And uh, I'd like to thank the uh, uh, International Program Committee for uh, setting up this uh, keynote lecture on quasi crystals and inviting me to deliver the lecture. Um, and I'll just uh, start uh, straight away. Um, I'm going to tell you a main story, which is about these soft matter quasi crystals. Uh, but I will have to tell you uh, one or two small stories uh, before that. Um, so um, uh, stay with me. Um, we will get to the main theme uh, very shortly. Just very quick acknowledgments. Quite a few people have worked with me um, on these questions over the years. Um, and let me start straight ahead. Um, about these so-called soft matter quasicrystals. Uh, when we think about quasicrystals, usually what we have in mind are these crystals that you're seeing here, crystals that are made out of metallic alloys, uh, where the order um, is uh, uh, at the atomic scale. It's the atoms that's themselves that order and form this uh, really amazing and wonderful structure that we call a quasicrystal. But in the last 10 years or so, a little over 10 years now, uh, we've uh, seen a lot of systems coming up where this same kind of order, the quasi-crystal and order, appears in systems which are not made out of single atoms, but are made out of building blocks which are much bigger and are also usually very, very soft. So really large molecules that can interpenetrate. And so the physics is really a different kind of physics than the hard solid state quasi-crystals that, that we know. So I'll uh, come back to these uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but let me very, very briefly first, you know, make sure that we're all uh, on the same page. We all know what we're talking about when we're talking about quasicrystals. And in fact, the question that I should be asking, again, very briefly, is what is a crystal? Of course, this is a congress of the uh, International Union on Crystallography, so we all know what crystals are. But let me just emphasize this one point, which is important for me. So <clears throat> if we would have been asked this question before 1982, before uh, Danny Chuckman's discovery, then we would say that a crystal is an ordered solid. And because it's ordered, then it must be periodic. And then there were some consequences uh, that are uh, related to the fact that it's ordered. Uh, the fact that there's a diffraction that shows very, very sharp Bragg peaks. And the position of these peaks is closed under vector addition. What, uh, basically what that basically implies is that we can index the pattern usually by choosing a small number of vectors, if we're in three dimensions, three wave vectors. Um, and then every other peak in the diffraction diagram is just a, an integer linear combination of these uh, basic vectors that we found. And so all these peaks fo form a discrete periodic lattice. 
And we know that there are very strong restrictions on these lattices. And, and we've known these crystals for a very long time. We see the external morphology and the diffraction diagram. But then in 1982, uh, with Schechtman's discovery, what we realized is that, yes, a crystal is an ordered solid. But the fact that a crystal is ordered does not necessarily imply that it has to be periodic. Uh, it still implies that the diffraction contains very sharp Bragg peaks. That's the signature of having long range order in the material. And their positions are still closed under vector addition, but they're essentially, essentially arbitrary uh, from this point on. So when we count different Bravais lattices, then essentially there's a hierarchy, an infinite hierarchy of Bravais, different types of Bravais lattices uh, that one can have. And of course, we've also removed the restriction on rotational symmetry. So if the crystal is periodic, then the symmetry is very, very strongly restricted to the famous two-fold, three-fold, four-fold, and six-fold rotation symmetries. But once we uh, uh, are no longer restricted to periodic crystals, then we've removed that uh, restriction. So a typical diffraction diagram of a quasi-crystal, of a crystal that is uh, not periodic like this, uh, is shown here um, on the screen now. You see the Bragg peaks. Uh, you can even see in your imagination that each pair of Bragg peaks add up to a third Bragg peak that's also in the diffraction diagram. So we now say that a crystal is a solid with long range order. Um, and the fact that it's ordered is uh, indicated by the fact that we have diffraction, um, Bragg peaks in the diffraction diagram. Now, when we look at a diffraction diagram like that, let's say we're looking at uh, some electronic uh, uh, density of the crystal, then uh, what we understand is that what we're seeing is the Fourier transform of the density of electrons in the crystal. In fact, we're seeing the, the Fourier spectrum, the magnitudes of these Fourier coefficients. But the main important point is that when we look at this uh, expansion of the density, then it's a, it's, it's a sum of wave vectors rather than a continuous integral over all wave vectors. And it's the fact that it's a sum like that, then we can actually count uh, the, the peaks in the diffraction diagram. Now, in this particular example, this is a a diffraction diagram with tenfold rotational symmetry, I can pick four, not less, but I can pick four wave vectors with which I can index this diffraction diagram. That means that every other peak here is a, a linear combination of these four vectors with integer uh, coefficients. So we need four integers to index this kind of a diffraction diagram. And um, this minimum number is what we call the rank of the crystal. And so now we can really define what we mean when we say quasi-crystal. So there are two numbers here to think about. There's the rank of the crystal that I'm uh, uh, denoting by the little r. And there's the physical dimension of the crystal. In this case, we're in two dimensions. So little d is 2. And we have a rank r, which is 4. And the classification basically says that anything that's described by a Fourier transform like this, where we can count the wave vectors, um, is classified as follows. If the rank is equal to the dimension, these are the ordinary periodic crystals that we've known about for many, many years. But if the rank is finite, it's a finite number, but can be greater than or equal to the dimension, then this kind of, of a structure would be called a quasi-periodic crystal. In fact, if the rank is not limited from above, if the rank can become infinite, then this is something we would call an almost periodic crystal. And there's a whole theory of almost periodic functions uh, that was discovered by Harold Bohr, the bro brother of uh, the more famous Bohr, um, about 100 years ago. Um, the one thing that's very important to uh, uh, note is if I look at the diffraction diagram and I add two of these vectors to get a third one, I might add another, I might reach a vector which is further away from the origin. But I can also add two vectors and obtain a vector which is closer to the origin. And because of the symmetry, there are actually 10 of these uh, vectors of the same length around a circle. So now I can continue adding. I can add two of these shorter vectors to get an even shorter one. But there are 10 of those, so I can add two of those and get an even shorter one. And this goes ad infinitum. So a very, very clear characteristic of these quasi-periodic crystals is that their diffraction diagram is what we uh, mathematically call dense. There's a dense set of points. If I randomly throw a dart at the board, then as close as I want to the position of my dart, there will be a Bragg peak. And the reason that we don't see all of them is because we perform experiments uh, with a finite time, with a finite amount of uh, 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 energy that goes in, um, or radiation that goes in. And so only 
uh, wave vectors whose uh, intensity is above some threshold actually appear in the diffraction diagram. If we run the experiment twice as long, then we will see additional peaks forming in between peaks that we've already seen before, which is not something that usually happens in periodic crystals. Um, so what is a quasi-crystal? Uh, we'll look at this. Uh, for the quasi-periodic crystal, I said that the rank can be equal then, equal to or greater than the dimension. But if I'm explicitly requiring the rank to be greater than the dimension, so it's explicitly no longer periodic, then this is what we would call a uh, quasi-crystal, which is short for quasi-periodic crystal. But we're explicitly referring to crystals that are no longer periodic. OK, so that was a little bit of background. Now to my prologue. So this is a, an external story to my main theme here. Uh, but I want to tell you a little bit about Faraday waves. So one of my greatest hero physicists is Michael Faraday. And we all know him for uh, his other work. But it turns out that in 18, around 1830, he discovered this phenomenon, which is also named after him, Faraday waves. Uh, he basically said the following thing. You take a plate of fluid and, and watch this video here. This plate of fluid is being shaken up and down, vibrated vertically okay, in the direction of gravity. Uh, what that does, because of the acceleration of the plate, is to effectively modulate the strength of gravity. And if you effectively modulate the strength of gravity, you're modulating a parameter in the system. And this induces an instability. This is called a parametric instability in nonlinear dynamics. But essentially what happens <coughs> sorry, is that the, um, um, the fluid surface um, is no longer flat. It develops this instability. And what Faraday saw are various types of patterns that are just uh, various uh, uh, plain, um, various normal modes on the surface, uh, various modes, sorry, on the surface um, of the uh, fluid. Now Faraday saw stripes, and Faraday saw these kinds of square patterns. Um, and I'm going to show you a more interesting pattern that showed up. Uh, the one thing I want to stress is uh, the fact that this pattern doesn't depend on the shape of the container. It really is the frequency with which you shake that is translated into a, a length scale, a, a wavelength in the system through the dispersion of the fluid. So different fluids for the same frequency will give you different length scales of patterns. So it turns out that in the early 90s, um, there was a group, and you can guess which country they were from, that repeated this experiment, now shaking the plate not with a single frequency, but with two frequencies, with a linear combination of two frequencies. Now, each frequency selects, selects a length scale. So now, in these patterns, we have two length scales that we can control in the experiments. And so now we're forming patterns out of two length scales rather than just one. And among the patterns that they saw using two frequencies, using two length scales, were these 12-fold symmetric quasi-crystals. Okay? Again, using the same definition from two slides ago, this is really a quasi-crystal. It's just not in a solid. It's on the surface of this fluid. Um, and here they say that the distance from uh, Bordeaux to Geneva is five centimeters in the plate that they were using. And again, they wanted to emphasize that it's not the shape of the plate that induces the pattern. It's the actual uh, modulation of gravity that does that. Now in that uh, paper uh, back in 1993, um, and I'm quoting, they said the following. They said the transition to a 12-fold, they called it a quasi-pattern, may be more common than previously supposed. So they were reflecting the fact that it was really easy for them to generate these interesting uh, patterns. Um, and so now I want to emphasize you know, the main results of this experiment were that we were using, they were using two frequencies. So two frequencies mean two length scales. And they emphasized one, another, one other important point, which was that when they shook the plate, they broke the symmetry between going up and coming back down. So when you add two sine waves, you can do something like this, for example. And this clearly breaks the symmetry of up and down. And only when they broke the symmetry did they see these interesting patterns uh, in their system. Now, in this particular experiment, they didn't see any eight-fold patterns or 10-fold patterns. They really only saw, uh, in terms of quasi-crystalline patterns, only these 12-fold symmetric patterns. So I was uh, young and ambition, ambitious a little over 20 years ago. Uh, we wanted to see if we can maybe um, motivated by this experiment, come up with a, you know, maybe some mathematical, uh, some basic theory uh, that will produce similar patterns uh, based on the same ideas that were uh, essentially uh, discovered in this experiment. Now, 
What we were doing is not something very new. We were repeating what people had been doing uh, for a very long time. And this is something that in dynamical systems is uh, called a, uh, looking for a Lyapunov functional. For us in material science, physics, chemistry, uh, this is referred to as a Landau free energy. In this case, it's really the same thing. And there were people working in that direction. Try to find uh, simple expansion in powers of, in the case of the fluid, the deviation of the fluid height from its uh, uh, average height uh, when it's uniform, or the deviation of the material density, if we're looking in, in, at a material, uh, from the average density. Say when it's a liquid, I have the average density everywhere. When it forms a solid, when it crystallizes, then I have deviations away from that average. So we want to describe a free energy as a function of an expansion in these uh, parameters uh, or gradients in, this param in these parameters. So um, as I said, in uh, dynamics, uh, this is a Lyapunov functional. And the one that I'm write, going to write down in a second was based on a very familiar equation called the swift hohenberg equation in, 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 in nonlinear dynamics. And in condensed matter, matter physics, as I said, this would be a Landau free energy. Um, and in fact, the functional that I'll be writing here is also uh, based on early work that was done in the 70s and then in the 80s, trying to explain the stability of quasicrystals. Uh, but at the time, it was not very successful in doing that. Um, so uh, let me show you this functional. This is the free energy. So I'm writing F uh, for, for, for free energy to remind us. And I'm using rho as the deviation of the density from its average value. And let me just very briefly take you through the different terms of this free energy um, just to guide you and, and you'll understand what we're going to look for. So the basic idea is that given certain set of external parameters, this epsilon here, alpha uh, and q, what we're looking for is the function, the structure, excuse me, that will minimize this free energy. This will be the globally, uh, 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 the global minimum of the free energy. This will be the equilibrium phase of the system. And so what I have here, first of all, are the two most basic terms that I can put in. This is a term that goes like rho squared. Um, if epsilon is positive, since I have a negative sign here, this would like the density to deviate away from zero. I can lower the free energy if I'm forming a structure. So this induces the growth. And then up here, I have a rho to the fourth. This basically says I have to pay some penalty for that at some point. So this is responsible to saturate the growth of my pattern, of my structure. Now, there are two additional uh, terms here. This, terms, this term here is representing the selection of two length scales. Remember, two frequencies correspond to two length scales. So in my model, I'm free to choose two length scales. And this is how I'm doing it. So you should think of this rho as a function of real space. But if I Fourier transform rho, then I will write it in terms of its Fourier modes. And each Fourier mode, when I take a second derivative, this Laplacian, will bring down a minus k squared, k being the wavelength of this uh, mode. And so if k in magnitude is equal to either 1 or q, then this is 0. There's no penalty in forming a mode whose wavelength is either 1 or q. But any other wavelength, there will be a price to pay to form that mode. So this is how I select the two modes that I want. And last but not least is this rho cubed term. And this is a term that I'm putting in because uh, the experimentalists told me that they only get the interesting patterns when they break this up-down symmetry. So up-down symmetry here uh, uh, applies to the fact that I'm changing the sign of rho. Now, without this term, changing the sign of rho will not affect the free energy. But with this term, I will have a changing of the sign uh, over here. And so this breaks the symmetry like I was told uh, by the experiments to do. Now, <clears throat> this is something that in the uh, fluid system is called a triad interaction. Because again, when I transform to Fourier space, what this implies is that whenever I have three modes whose wave vectors add up to 0, then they can resonantly interact and lower the free energy. So I'm forming this triangle of wave vectors in Fourier space. And whenever I can form a triangle like that, I am lowering the free energy. In terms of uh, density, uh, material density, this just means that I have some sort of an effective three-body interaction uh, in my system. OK, so what did we get uh, back then, 20 years ago, when we studied this model, uh, um, <coughs> both analytically and um, numerically? Uh, well, first of all, if we remove this alpha, 
no symmetry breaking term, then what we got are just the simple stripes. And what I'm showing you up here is the real space image uh, out of a simulation. And down here is the Fourier transform. So this would be zero of k space, and I have a, a plus one and a minus one in a particular direction. Now, what would I get when I do have an alpha? When I do have these triad resonances, well, it then depends on the value of q. So if one length scale is one, the other length scale is q. q is the ratio of length scales of the two length scales in my pattern. What I want to do is really use the fact that triangles can lower the free energy. So what I want to do, if I want to have uh, wave vectors around a circle with an angle of 2 pi over n, because I want to induce quasi-crystals with symmetry, uh, an n-fold symmetry, then what I'll do is I'll take two unit vectors whose, uh, where the angle between them is 2 pi over n, and I'll just take their sum to be the second length scale q. So two vectors in an inner circle with a third vector on an outer circle will allow me to close triangles and, and uh, reduce the free energy. So this is what we got. Uh, so when we choose q to be the square root of two, so here this is one and this is q, then we get a very nice periodic uh, square crystal. Uh, but then when we choose q to be um, the length that will give me uh, um, two pi over 12, okay, so a 30 degree angle, then if alpha is not sufficiently strong, then I get a very nice periodic hexagonal crystal. But if alpha is sufficiently strong, we indeed were able to see this 12 fold symmetric uh, crystal. So here you see uh, the inner ring uh, of wavelength one and an outer ring of wavelength u. What do we not get here? Uh, we do not get eight fold symmetry, octagonal. And we just barely get the cagonal symmetry. So barely that back then in that paper, we didn't see that we got 10-fold symmetry. But over the years, we saw there was a little error in that paper. And we can, we can stabilize 10-fold symmetry. Uh, but why is 12-fold so nice here? Uh, well, this is a consideration. As I said, in Fourier space, for every mode that I add into my structure, there's a price to pay in that uh, uh, quartic term, the road to the fourth. But whenever they come in in triplets, that add up exactly to zero, a triangle of wave vectors, then I actually can gain a lot. So it's kind of a balance between adding modes and being able to close triangles. Adding modes costs money, closing triangles saves me, sorry, energy. Uh, closing triangles uh, saves me free energy. Um, and so what we have here is for different kinds of structures, um, counting the number of modes, basically how many Bragg peaks I see in the diffraction, and counting the number of triangles that I can close, then you can see that uh, in the eightfold, in this particular way of trying to form a tenfold, uh, there's just not enough triangles. Uh, in this other way of trying to obtain a, a tenfold, there's just enough triangles. And for the twelvefold, just because twelve is divisible by three, we really get a huge number of triangles, and this really stabilizes it very, uh, very strongly. So the key idea is that we have modes of different scales interacting nonlinearly in a way that breaks the row to minus row symmetry. Uh, and this is done via this three-body uh, interaction. Um, it was very surprising at the time, 20 years ago, to see that such a simple free energy and the dynamical equation that you write based on that free energy is a very simple dynamical equation of a two-dimensional field yields as its solution a quasi-crystal. This was a time when we still thought that it might be you know, difficult to generate a quasi-crystal in some physical send setting, uh, but it turned out to be very, very simple. Uh, the dynamics itself can be very flexible. Let me not go into that detail. The most important thing in that paper, I think, is that we said, you know, we were a bit full of ourselves, but we said, we note that our model may apply to situations other than Faraday waves, although we didn't have an idea of what this situation would be. Uh, just because it's such a generic idea, it wasn't based rigorously on a particular system. We just borrowed the ideas from the Faraday wave system, and we wrote this free energy. And there was some criticism over the years. Let me not go into that. So now to my main story. So I want to talk about soft quasicrystals. <clears throat> I won't give you a very comprehensive review of soft quasicrystals. I really want to follow this idea and show you how we can come up with a mechanism to stabilize and understand the stability of these kinds of quasicrystals. Uh, but if you do want a review, a very wonderful review was written by Tomonari Dotera, who I saw here earlier um, a few years ago. I highly recommend that uh, if you want an, a really uh, overview of uh, all, this, all the different systems and, and, and a lot of the physics. Uh, I'll just point out a few examples. 
So the first example came up in 2004. This was a system made out of uh, these uh, dendrimers. Uh, these are very big molecules. I'm a theoretical physicist, so don't ask me to go into details. But the basic idea is that this molecules look, these molecules look like branches of trees. And the tip of the branch, that's the side that doesn't like water, and the other side is the side that likes water. So when you put it in solution, what happens is they protect the tips by forming a sphere out of these uh, little cones. And so the main building block, the basic building block, is a sphere like that, a so-called miso. And it turns out that under certain conditions, you see 12-fold uh, symmetric structures. And this is a small angle x-ray scattering. This is a real experimental result that you're seeing here. Uh, and you can count uh, the Bragg peaks. You have 12 in a circle. So the first 12-fold symmetric soft quasi-crystal. The second system showed up uh, very quickly afterwards. Uh, this is a system made out of polymers. It's an ABC star polymer, which means that you have three polymers, an A, a B, and a C, and they're all connected at one point. And again, I'm not going into the symmetry. The basic idea one needs to know is that they really hate each other. They're made to join at that point, so they can't get away from each other. But now when you put a lot of them together, they really want to stay away from each other. So the first thing that they do is they generate these columns where red is over red and yellow over yellow and blue over blue. But now they have to arrange themselves in the plane normal to these columns. And what often happens is that they generate very nice two-dimensional tilings of the plane. And it so happened that under certain, considera certain uh, 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 ratios of lengths of A and B and C, what they saw was a, well, maybe not a perfect, but a 12-fold, uh, something that is very close to a 12-fold symmetric uh, quasi-crystal. And you can see um, the, a TEM, a direct TEM imaging. Uh, you see different grayscales from the different polymers. You can really see the tiles. And you can take a Fourier transform and, and count uh, the number of circles. This is very nicely uh, arranged, a nice, very nicely arranged structure. And then there were additional uh, um, examples, experimental examples. This is an example of nanoparticles. These are uh, iron oxide and gold nanoparticles of various nanometric dimensions. And uh, again, so they, they passivate, the, they treat the surfaces in a certain way such that they won't just uh, uh, attach by van der Waals forces. Uh, they put them in a fluid. Uh, they let them arrange themselves, remove the fluid, put under the TM, and you see these very nicely arranged structures. And again, uh, diffract, uh, <coughs> Fourier transform shows that this also has 12-fold rotational symmetry. And another sim system, mesoporosilica, and another system of, uh, this time, block polymers that form micelles. Uh, and in this case, uh, they even seem to uh, report a quasi-crystal with 18-fold sy symmetry, not just 12-fold symmetry. Uh, so there was a whole range of structures that started popping up and showing predominantly 12-fold symmetric quasi-crystals. Um, so you know, we want to understand the origin of stability of these structures. But you know, as theorists, we'll be happy, even if we don't underst understand the stability of these particular structures, if we just borrow ideas from this experiment and come up with a, with a mechanism that could stabilize a quasi-crystal, something that would give me a concrete predictive uh, tool for saying, if I generate uh, a, a, a particles with such and such uh, properties, this will give me a 12-fold or a 10-fold uh, quasi-crystal. So this is the aim. So you know, note the fact that we have 12-fold symmetry in all of these structures. Uh, the first question to ask is, you know, is it possible that the same principle is at work? Or if I rephrase it a little bit, maybe we can use the same principle to show a mechanism that will work for soft quasi crystals. Um, and if so, again, as I said, <clears throat> or no, I haven't said yet, it'd be interesting to understand the relative roles of energy and entropy. In soft matter, entropy is very important in stabilizing structures. In quasi crystals, many people think, again, that entropy is very important in stabilizing them, even in the solid state. So this is a good system to try to answer that question. Um, and then can we control and predict uh, the structures. So what I want to start with is the simplest system I can think of. And the simplest system I can think of in terms of the ones that I showed you is a system like those micelles at the beginning uh, that is composed of particles that are perfectly spherical, so completely isotropic. I just have a single type of particle, no A and B and C, 
Um, and the description of the particle itself is also very simple. The idea is that these particles have some sort of soft inner core with kind of hairs sticking out of it that are even softer than the core. So the whole thing is very soft, but the inner core is soft and the outer uh, shoulders are even softer. And so the question is, can something like this produce a quasi crystal? Simplistic way of looking at it. So let me make it even simpler. Let's try to write down the interaction potential between two such particles. So I have these two particles. When they're far away, they don't know anything about each other. Now when they come closer to each other, when these outer hairs just start touching, then there's a certain repulsion between them. So this is this point here. I, um, sorry. I label this distance, I call this distance capital R, when they just uh, touch each other. And then when they become even closer, just you can't see here, but there's a little R down here. When they come even closer and the inner cores touch each other, then again they're soft, but they're not as soft as the outer uh, shoulders, so there's a slightly higher repulsion. So when the cores meet, this is a distance that I normalize to, to call one, um, then there's a slightly uh, stronger repulsion between the particles. And that's it. Okay, this is the simplest potential I can think of to try to uh, kind of motivate myself by these particles. And the question is, can something as silly as this produce a quasi-crystal? Okay, and this is isotropic. This is the same in every direction. Okay? So that's what we tried to find out. So we go through a little bit of uh, statistical mechanics. I, want, I won't go into the details, but eventually we obtain a very standard textbook free energy after we coarse grain this system of particles, which consists of two terms. I have an energy term, which is a non-local term. It uh, contains this potential U that I displayed on the previous slide. So I have a particle here and a particle there, and I have the interaction between them. And then I have an entropy term, or a temperature multiplied by an entropy. And the entropy term is a local term. Okay? All it cares about is the density, and C of R is the density of the particles at the point R. And this is a very standard form for uh, just a gas of, of, uh, of particles. Okay. And so the question is, what can I do with this? And what I'm displaying beneath it is the free energy that we wrote 20 years ago to try to explain those Faraday waves that I just told you about. And so when I compare these two together, I, I, I see that there are you know, similarities because both of them are quite standard. The energy term, the non-local term, is replaced by this term that calculates gradients. So a gradient is a non-local operator. It needs to know a little bit up behind and a little bit ahead in order to calculate the gradient. So this is a non-local term that replaces, that is replaced now by the energy term. And this expansion in powers of rho, rho squared, rho cubed, rho to the fourth, this essentially is replaced by the entropy term. So the question is, can I learn from my previous knowledge about these Faraday waves about you know, how to treat this very simple and generic uh, free energy and basically you know, try to understand how to design that two-step potential to get my quasi crystal. So what we learned from Faraday waves is that we need two controlled length scales or two length scales whose ratio is controllable and I need those three body interactions to get those triangles to stabilize the structure to lower the free energy. So where would they come from and how could we control them? Well what we did and this is just, you know, just to get a, a, a basic idea of where we're going with this, is we took this logarithmic entropy term that was written here, the C log C that was written here, and we just expanded it in powers of the deviation of the density from the average density. Okay, so delta C now is the deviation from C bar, which is the average density. So these are now normalized rows like I had previously in the, uh, in the old Faraday wave uh, um, free energy, okay? So after we, after we expand like this, then it's quite obvious what, what we need to do here. The three body interaction terms appear here in the expansion of the entropy. So they're somewhere hidden in that entropy. And of course, the energy scale, the two energy scales, they have to come from the pair potential. And so here's my pair potential, not energy scale, the two uh, length scales come from the energy. So here's my potential. Oh, and we also get a prediction for the so-called spinodal decomposition temperature uh, from this kind of a free energy. So the question is, how do I set the values of this potential? So remember, I scaled this length to one and this energy to one. 
So this whole potential is given by two numbers, the position of this smaller step and the height of this smaller step. This is capital R and this is little u, excuse me for the small font. So the question is, how do I set this value r? Is r divided by one the same uh, uh, number that I used earlier uh, to get my 12-fold quasicrystals if, I, if, I, if that's what I want to get? Is that this 1.932? Well, um, we could try, but this idea of trying out potentials with two length scales, <coughs> this is not a new idea. You know, I have to say that it goes back uh, in a, you know, a few decades where people tried different kinds of pair potentials and they knew that they needed to put in two length scales with a given ratio to get a particular quasicrystal. That's not what we want to do here. We don't want to guess. We now understand the mechanism. So the question is, can we design it to give us exactly what we want? And the idea is, again, to compare. This was this non-local term in the Faraday wave free energy. This is what it looks like in Fourier space. Remember, every del squared turns into a minus k squared. And if I plot this energy, I hope you can see something. Excuse me for the resolution. Um, this is what it looks like. It's something that really does have two minima that do not cost any free energy if I just have the right length scales, one and q. But these are length scales in Fourier space. So the ratio q is something that we set in Fourier space. It's not something that we set in real space. And the difference here is because we're doing a Fourier transform only on the radial coordinate uh, of a system that's described in, in polar coordinates. Okay? This is so-called Henkel transform. It's not, it won't just give me one over the ratio in, in real space. So we really need to do this in Fourier space. What we want to do is design that potential, our two-step potential or any other potential, so that it will have two minima with roughly equal heights and a controlled ratio of their positions in K space, in Fourier space. And if we take this two-step potential, we can actually do that. So this is the Fourier transform of the potential. And um, <clears throat> to get that uh, Q, which is the 1.932, the magic number, what we do is, we, what we need to do is to set R to be one point turns out to be 746, roughly, okay? So this is not something we would have guessed, okay? But now this is what we want to design. Um, I just want to make one important point, is that I need to be able to take my pair potential in Fourier transform. Not every pair potential is Fourier transformable. So if the interaction between particles diverges too strongly when they get close together, I cannot Fourier transform this. So if I want to describe you know, uh, hardcore interacting particles and understand what they're doing, I have to go to Tomonari Dutera here and ask him what to do because our theory here does not apply to those systems. Uh, but there are people uh, who are studying hardcore particles. Okay, so now we're ready. This is my free energy. I've designed the potential. I just plug it into my computer. I numerically look, numerically search for the minimum free energy state with this free energy and this is what I see. Um, and I, I hope you can see something. From, from my angle, I can't see anything. On the left, I see the real space structure, the quasi-crystal. And on the right, I see the Fourier transform, the diffraction pattern from this structure. So I have uh, surprisingly very, very sharp, a very, very sharp structure in, on the left and a lot, a lot of harmonic on the right-hand side. Um, OK, this is nice, uh, but you might argue that it's some sort of a self-consistent argument. I designed something so that my particular free energy will find its minimum there, and it found its minimum there. The question is, will this work with real particles? So in order to do that, we engaged Michael Engel, who knows how to do much more complicated simulations. Uh, we wanted to do molecular dynamic simulations, where the temperature is, is really uh, um, simulated properly. It's not just a parameter in a free energy. It really induces fluctuations. It does whatever uh, a temperature is supposed to do. And we gave Michael these uh, five potentials here. You're seeing U as a function of R. Now he wanted smooth potentials that you can differentiate, so no steps, and he didn't want them to be constant because the force is the derivative of this. He didn't want zero force. Um, so we designed these potentials for him, and we gave them to him, and we didn't tell him what is to be expected out of them. And if you look at them like this, you can't even tell what's expected out of them. But if you look at their Fourier transform, then you'll see that they were designed to mimic 
the uh, term from the free energy that we use for Faraday waves. So in Fourier space, all of these five potentials have one minimum at one, at k equals one, and a second minimum at various positions, which are the square root of two to give me a square crystal, the square root of three to give me a hexagonal crystal, the golden ratio to give me a decagonal crystal, a tenfold crystal, and that uh, uh, special value to give me a twelvefold crystal, and even two up here to give me just uh, straight lines. And so we uh, gave it to him, and it took him about a week to fiddle with the programs, but eventually this is exactly what he got from these potentials. We didn't have to change anything. Okay? So the idea is that you set the different ratios Q according to what I just explained, and what we find are phases that are called cluster crystals. Now what are cluster crystals? Cluster crystals are formed by these ultra soft particles, particles that can really interpenetrate each other. And so the first thing that they do is they do interpenetrate and they just generate these clusters that are completely disordered, just a mumble jumble of particles, a clump of particles, a cluster. And these clusters are now the main building blocks that form the crystal itself. So here on the left you see this uh, system of stripes. Um, the red are the actual particles in the molecular dynamic simulation. And in the corner here in grayscale, what you see is a minimization of that free energy just using a, a, a density field, a mean field a description of the same system. So this is a very mean field-like system. It's very well described by its mean field. So you see the stripes, um, or a so-called lamellar phase, and then you see the periodic square and hexagonal crystals, and then you see the quasi-crystals, um, the decagonal crystal, and the dodecagonal crystal. So these we can now form just by taking a pair potential, Fourier transforming that pair potential, designing that pair potential in Fourier space, and then going back and running molecular dynamics simulations. <coughs> so the question is, what next? Um, well, I did promise a special paper for uh, IUCRJ um, for this conference. I didn't finish writing it. Oh, well, I didn't finish it writing it in time. Now it's been written, and it's being submitted to IUCRJ as we speak. And so a lot of the things, um, I'll just send you to that paper to read because I won't tell you, I won't tell you all the secrets. Um, but now we've developed a very nice tool, um, and this was done by a very, very bright student, Sam Savitz from Caltech, who's working with me on this. A very nice approximate tool to calculate the free energies in the original uh, LP, that LP model from 20 years ago. Um, and so this is a typical example of an approximate phase diagram showing the dodecagonal phase, the hexagonal phase, this laminar phase of stripes um, as a function of um, this control parameter that we have in that model epsilon and the strength with which we select the length scales. So if we select the length scales very strongly, very precisely, then we're up here and here we know exactly what the, uh, ground, the minimum free energy states are. As C becomes smaller and smaller, we don't know exactly what it is, uh, but this is a rough phase diagram. Um, it matches very nicely this line here that was calculated by a so-called projection method by this Chinese group in a much more precise way, so we're happy that that fits. Um, but uh, the nice thing about our approach is that it's, it's really easy to calculate our, uh, using that approach. And I just want to point out this interesting triple point uh, it'd be nice to see that in, in numerical simulation, to see these three phases uh, all stable at the same point. Um, we've extended the model, the original Faraday model, uh, to see other symmetries that we did not see 20 years ago. Uh, here I'm showing you an example of an eightfold crystal, octagonal crystal, and an octadecagonal uh, crystal, an 18-fold crystal. I'll tell you the secret. The secret is to allow more than two length scales. When we allow more than two length, length scales, uh, we can really force um, the more length scales we allow, we can really force the structure to do what, it, what we want it to do. And I want to end with this example, which is what happens when I now move from just a single type of particle to two types of particles. The nice thing about going to two types of particles is that I think it will give me maybe a chance to talk to experimentalists and convince them to try to do this in the lab. Because with a single kind of particle, I need quite a complicated interaction potential between the particles because the potential needs to encode those two length scales that I need in the structure. But if I have two types of particles, 
then each particle can just encode one length scale. So I can live with much simpler potentials that are maybe more realizable in the lab. Okay, so this is my motivation of going to uh, two types of particles, uh, which then in this uh, coarse grain picture uh, will be described by two fields. So there's the blue density, C1 of K, and there's the green density that you can barely see, the C2 of K. Um, the blues interact with the blues, and the greens interact with the greens, and there's also an interaction between the blues and the greens, which is in red here. And what you see here are the Fourier transforms of the pair potential. So you see that the green has a length scale uh, minimum down here, and the blue has a minimum down here, and hopefully we can control the positions of these two minima to have the ratio that will eventually give me the structure that I'm looking for. But the thing is, remember that I really need the two length scales to interact. And if I look at the most simple entropy term that I have in this system, then the entropy term, there's one entropy term for the blue particles, and there's one entropy term for the green particles. And so the nonlinear interaction, I don't see it here. So where is that going to come from? Okay, each field carries one length scale, but how do we get them to interact nonlinearly? Okay, so you think about that a little bit. And if you've taught, say, analytical mechanics or anything like that in the past, then you say, well, I've been telling my students this for many years. I don't know why it took me so long to come up with that here. When we look at a system like that, what we're really interested are in are the normal modes of the system. So now if I look at the top row here, I have the blue particles and I have the green particles, but they're interacting linearly. What I need to do is to what we call diagonalize this interaction, this upper line here. Okay? And if when we diagonalize that, then we find the normal modes of the system. And the normal modes of the system, let me diagonalize with a click of the button, uh, which are now in uh, uh, blue and uh, cyan and magenta. These are now linear combinations. These are fields that are linear combinations of the two different components. But these particular linear combinations, they now don't interact with each other. But when I express the blue and the green in terms of these linear combinations, that will introduce nonlinear interactions between them, between the cyan and the magenta quasi-particles. Okay? So this is what I'm working with. Um, what you have here is the, are the pair potentials of the magenta and the cyan particles. And what you see here is that the minima, the relevant minima, when I'm coming from the fluid to the uh, solid, to the crystal, is when I'm coming from down here, these are just minima of the magenta potential. So it's just this particular linear combination of the two particles that's relevant for the phase transition from the liquid to the crystal that I'm looking for. So I'm actually back to where I started from. So what I need to do is just control the positions of these uh, uh, minima in this particular linear combination of the two types of particles. So in fact, it does work. Uh, this is uh, something we have not published yet, so don't tell anyone. Um, but the idea is that uh, it works with various symmetries. So what you see here is using the length scale square root of true. Square root of two will produce the square periodic crystals. You see here the red particles. You see here the blue particles. You see them here overlaid together. And here you see the separate Fourier transforms of the blue and of the red. So you can see that the blue has the length scale uh, square root of two more predominant and the blue has the length scale one more predominant in its Fourier transform. Um, and we can also get a quasi-crystal like that. So here you have a tenfold quasi-crystal, the red, the blue, the nice way they fit together, and the diffraction patterns of the different uh, types of uh, patterns. But this is, again, just minimizing my free energy after I've designed the potential to minimize that free energy to give me what I want. Again, the question is, does this work with real particles? And so these simulations uh, we've now done in-house. My student did that. Uh, of course, Michael Engel helped him set it up. Uh, but what you see here is this square uh, crystal uh, now made out of particles. You see the clusters of particles again. You see the red clusters. You see the blue clusters. And you see how they overlay together exactly as predicted by the mean field uh, description. Again, this is a very mean field-like uh, system. It's very well described by its mean field. Uh, here I even have a simulation showing how this uh, forms. It's really sped up quite a lot. Uh, the nice thing is that you can actually see that uh, there's a grain boundary at the beginning over here on the left, and at some point it flips, and we get the uh, stable state 
of the system. Uh, and now let me show you that we can also get the tenfold crystal uh, out of numerical simulations. Uh, so again, this is the, uh, on the top you see the mean field description. On the bottom you see the particles, the red particles, the blue particles, and how nicely they fit together. Um, let me show you a bigger image. Uh, what you see on the left is again a, a movie of a simulation of the particles after the system has reached its steady state. This is, this is the structure. You see that there's still temperature. Particles are kind of juggling around. In fact, I think the structure looks cleaner when it juggles around than when you see a snapshot because you really need to let the particles explore uh, all the positions that uh, they can take you. Um, I just want to, well, let me skip this. Well, maybe I will say. So uh, there's a lot of freedom in, in controlling the different potentials that we use. And for example, the, poten the interaction between blue and red, we can decide if it's repulsive or attractive when they're on top of each other at, at uh, r equals zero. If it's repulsive when they're on top of each other, then you'll see a system like this, where the blue and the red sit at different positions. But when they're attractive, it, the blue and red can belong to the same cluster. There's no problem uh, in doing that. So there's quite a lot of control here. I'm saying that if there's an experimentalist in the audience who might want to, to do something like this in the lab. There is a lot of freedom. Um, OK. Um, let me show you uh, what happens with temperature. So these are clusters um, at a fairly high temperature that's below solidification, below the fluid phase. We, we obtain this uh, three-fold cluster. Q is the square root of uh, three, sorry, six-fold hexagonal uh, crystal. Um, and as I lower the temperature, what we see is less and less juggling of the particles, and the clusters become more and more and more concentrated. Uh, basically allowing each particle to be exactly where it wants to be. I mean, uh, they really would like to be all on, at the same point so that their distance from the particles in the next cluster is exactly the distance that minimizes their interaction. Uh, but of course, temperature doesn't allow that if it's too high. Um, one last thing is that when you run these kinds of simulations, uh, you often end up with structures you didn't imagine could exist. Um, so this was our failed attempt to generate a binary dodecagonal quasi-crystal. Um, in fact, we have not yet managed to generate that, but now, after writing this paper to IUCRJ, uh, we understand why we couldn't get it. Uh, in fact, we understand why in these uh, mean field theories where the entropy term replaces the simple um, three-body interactions, uh, in fact, the tenfold crystal is actually more robust and more stable than the 12-fold crystal actually a surprising result. You'll have to read the IUCRJ paper to see what the reason for that is. Um, in fact, so we were trying to get this, and we found this uh, neat system. In fact, it's very similar to a system that was uh, described recently by uh, Andy Archer and collaborators uh, in a system of single particles. Here we see it in a binary system. Um, what we did is we colored some of the blue particles in green. I hope you can see that. To demonstrate the fact that the blue channels are completely fluid. The particles can move along these, this hexagonal uh, uh, honeycomb structure, um, and it's only the clusters in the middle that contains both red and blue points uh, that are fixed in place and cannot um, move around. Okay, um, so this really brings me to my summary. Um, I guess you need to be old enough to be able to write a paper 20 years ago and um, not make a lot of impact, actually. It didn't make a lot of impact 20 years ago. Um, but you know, knowing that maybe someday it'll be relevant to a different system, and then this new system pops up almost out of nowhere. Um, and again, I must admit, we did not specifically explain the stability of any of those five examples, experimental examples that I showed you. But what we have here, which I think is fairly unique within the quasi-crystal community, is a very specific mechanism, a very specific scheme that allows us to design interactions between particles and predict the, crust, the, the crystals that will form uh, under the phase transition from the fluid uh, to the crystal phase. Um, the question of formation and stability of quasi-crystals, even though we're now 35 years after their discovery, um, is still not fully understood. I mean, we understand, we know different mechanisms. We know in the solid state that uh, electrons play an important role. 
Um, we have a fair understanding of things, but not one precise mechanism, I think, uh, that really takes you from, from the notepad, uh, hopefully, definitely, to the computer and hopefully to the lab uh, that will really allow you to control, to design and then control uh, what forms. Um, so let me just re-emphasize the main idea. The main idea is, again, that I have modes of different scales. I want to control these scales somehow. I need to make sure that these modes will interact non-linearly because that is what stabilizes the structure once the length scales have been selected. And then this interaction must break this original up-down symmetry or rho going to minus rho uh, symmetry. Um, again, surprisingly, it's very easy to write down an equation that generates a quasi-crystal. Um, and there's a lot of flexibility. For example, the dynamics can be very flexible. I can use dynamics which just searches for the minimum, just going downhill in this potential, in this free energy land scale, a land scale. <clears throat> or, I can, um, or I can choose dynamics, for example, that preserves the density. So a mass preserving dynamics will look very different when I, when I look at it on the computer, but it, again, will find these minima um, and, and so, so these are um, things that I can be very flexible with uh, in doing. Um, and I said, um, it works very well with particle dynamics. It works with binary systems. Um, and, and the main point, and this is the clue why, for example, here, the tenfold quasi-crystal, the decagonal crystal, is actually more robust, is because this logarithmic entropy term breaks this row going to minus row symmetry in a very different way than the very simplistic uh, cubic term that we had uh, in the original model. So that behaves a bit differently. Um, and as I said, um, we have the tool to control the self-assembly of these kinds of structures uh, because these are not atomic solid state quasi-crystals. The interactions between atoms are given to us. We can't control them. But when we have these big molecules that we might be able to synthesize, we have the hope of being able to design an interaction to give us uh, the structures that we need. So thank you very much for your attention. I just have a, a question about uh, the symmetry breaking. So in your, in your model, is this a global symmetry breaking or just locally because of simulation you find a uh, five-fold symmetry? Uh, in other words, can you predict there is a seven-fold symmetry? So, so let me just uh, clarify. Um, there are two breakings of symmetry that are going on here in this story. The one symmetry, the one kind of symmetry breaking, that's the important one. That's the one that I don't want to interfere with. I just want the system to do on its own. Right. And that's going from the fluid to the crystal, from the liquid to the crystal. Going from the liquid to the crystal, I'm not assisting the system. I'm making sure that the free energy or the interaction between the particles is fully isotropic. Okay, it looks the same exactly in every direction. And the transition is a symmetry breaking phase transition that now makes it into a square, hexagonal, decagonal, dodecagonal, uh, quasi-crystal. That's the one symmetry breaking that I'm not touching. The other type of symmetry breaking is just the fact that the free energy does not have the symmetry of taking the density into minus itself. Now, it's not the density, because the density cannot be negative. I always have a positive density of particles. But if I'm looking at the deviation of the density from its average value, OK? so high density peaks and low density peaks relative to the average, that is going to be asymmetric. Right. So I'm going to have, and, and it, you can actually see it in some of the uh, images that, uh, that I've drawn. I think it would, might take me a long time to find it. Um, but you see in many of the structures that we have very highly dense, uh, those are in red uh, areas in the density, and very shallow blue areas. So we have shallow 
negative densities, but a lot of them, and very few, very sharp uh, positive densities. It's this breaking between high density, low density, or the fluid height going up or going down, this is what I've, I'm breaking. But not the, not the rotational uh, symmetry within that. Just curious whether you have ever seen seven-folded symmetry breaking like uh, in simulation. Um, so uh, we, we know that we will not get seven-fold with just two length scales. We know that to get seven-fold, you will need at least three, probably four length scales. Uh, we haven't tried that yet. So this is really new result, the eight-fold and the 18-fold that we generated using four length scales. So in order to get the quasi-crystals that have, remember at the beginning of my talk, I defined this notion of the rank of a quasi-crystal. So how many irrational ratios do I have in the structure? The more irrational ratios I have in the structure, the more complex it is. The higher the rank, the more length scales I need to put in by hand if I really want the force the structure to, to be what I want. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other burning questions? Otherwise, one will be around during the week for informal discussion. And before uh, I let you go to the uh, coffee break, I will ask uh, member of the local organizing committee to say a few words. Yeah, I thank the uh, speaker for a wonderful lecture. And uh, I would like to give a small uh, memento to the speaker and the chair for their wonderful job. Thank you.